Everybody, it's Jeff Antoniak here. Welcome to Digging Deeper Jazz. So today I want to start a conversation about rhythm changes. What are rhythm changes? How do we play rhythm changes? As always, this is for all instruments. I know I'm holding a saxophone, but this will apply to drummers for them to understand a little bit better what's going on, phrasing, all that stuff. This is going to be good for everybody. So I'm going to do probably three, maybe four videos sort of over the course of time talking about rhythm changes. This is one of the most important forms we have in jazz. And so what I mean is the 12-bar blues. That's probably the most important form. Set of chord changes, length of measures, that sort of thing. And rhythm changes definitely is gonna come in a close second. You have to know about rhythm changes. You have to know how to negotiate rhythm changes, what makes them tick, because everything in jazz, all the great songs we play, have elements of rhythm changes in them, or they just are rhythm changes songs. Okay, I keep saying rhythm changes, those two words over and over again. What does that mean? Now, here's the thing. I know I had this experience as a young, inexperienced player, and I think most of us do at some point. Like, what's, what is it about the rhythm of the changes and what's changing and why is it rhythmic? There's a lot of confusion um, when we first hear rhythm changes. Here's the thing. When we say rhythm changes, that is referring to the song, I Got Rhythm, by George and Ira Gershwin, a song that goes like this. That's the first little bit of I Got Rhythm, famous tune from back in the day. Uh, jazz musicians loved improvising over that song, so they would play it all the time. And we, jazz musicians started writing their own compositions over the form and chord changes of rhythm changes. So instead of saying, hey, do you feel like playing a song based on the song I Got Rhythm by George and Ira Gershwin, it got shortened to, hey, let's play rhythm changes, as in I Got Rhythm Changes. The changes referring to the song, the chord changes, the form, A-A-B-A, -A -A, all of that biz. So that's important to know, and I know some of you are rolling your eyes right now, Hold your eyeballs, because you know the first time you heard the phrase <laughs> rhythm changes, you had no idea what the hell they were talking about either. So there, now we all know. Good to know. Rhythm changes. Now, what I want to do today, I'm just going to talk about the A section of rhythm changes to make this nice and short and sweet. And um, we're going to talk about one approach to the A section. So you can see on the screen, I have the first eight measures of a couple different rhythm changes tunes. Lester Leaps In is one written by the great Lester Young. Salt Peanuts is one written by Dizzy Gillespie, and there are a zillion more of these songs. So um, what I did is wrote the first A section. Rhythm Changes is an A, A, B, A form, meaning you play those eight measures. You play them again. That's the second A. The bridge is something different, and then the last A section is the first thing you played. There it is, A, A, B, A. So we, if, when we learn these eight measures and understand what makes them tick in a variety of different ways, we've got a lot of rhythm changes done. So that's why I'm limiting the discussion today to just the A section. And that's what you see here. Those chord changes are the chord changes to I Got Rhythm. There's a lot of chords there. Two chords in every measure, right? There's 15 or 16 chords in those eight measures. Now we'll dig into that more next time, but I can tell you it's a one, six, two, progression. It's a progression that we see a lot. Just the first four chords. One, six, two, five. One, six, two, five. So that's the first two measures, and it's the next two measures, measures three and four. It also happens to be the last two measures. So even within an A section, rhythm changes has this little AAB form inside its A section. It's two measures of something, two measures of the same thing, the third two measures is a little different. The last two measures, same as the first two. It's got this very cool form inside of form. So I don't want you to worry too much about the chord changes for right now. We're talking about melodic improvising today. And my point here is that we can improvise diatonically. That is a huge, tried and true, fantastic approach to playing rhythm changes. Now, when I played that Gershwin song, uh, let me play it again for you. Mm -hmm. 
every note that I played there was from the B flat concert scale. So I am playing rhythm changes in B flat, and every note I played in that song, that famous song, was built from the notes of the B flat major scale. So let me play the song on the sheet that I put here for you. Lester leaps in, in the key of B flat. <laughs> Famous, famous tune, and it's made from the B-flat major scale. More specifically, it's less than the B-flat major scale. It's the B-flat pentatonic scale. So maybe you know about that. You can always go back and find out more about the pentatonic scale. Let me play um, the last thing I have on the sheet here for you. It is written by the great Dizzy Gillespie. It's called Salt Peanuts. <laughs> And I'm going to throw in another one for you, theme to the Flintstones, which is sort of a rhythm changes tune. So when I was growing up, the Flintstones. Now this is literally back like in the prehistoric days of Flintstones. <laughs> So I've now played for you four different songs, each incredibly famous and played and recorded by tens, well, hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people. What do they have in common? They are all diatonic melodies. They aren't really getting inside the chord changes. You, if you've listened to uh, any of these videos, you know I like playing with uh, arpeggios and getting inside the chords. And of course, that's a big hallmark of a great jazz player. Can they nail the changes? I am not talking about that here. I am talking about playing over the changes in a diatonic way. So what that simply means is Dizzy Gillespie told you in this song, you can play diatonically because he wrote a song like that. And Lester Young told you that. And the great composer of the Flintstones told you that. And on and on, George Gershwin told you, hey, diatonic works pretty well. So how about if you listen to them? You don't have to listen to me. Listen to Dizzy Gillespie instead. How about if we develop our melodic sense over rhythm changes and figure out how to play something that hangs together? So the good news is we can play diatonically. And what that means is in the key of, if we're playing B-flat rhythm changes, in the key of B-flat, the first chord. So it turns out Salt Peanuts is uh, originally in the key of F. It's actually F rhythm changes. So you would play the F concert major scale, or, or pentatonic works fine too. So the idea is that now tells you about harmonically and melodically where to hang your hat, what to deal with. So that simplifies things. Chord-wise, forget about them. Okay, that's easy. Um, melodically, you can just use sort of this one scale, this one mode in a sense. Now, that's very limited, so what do you have to do? You have to have a fantastic sense of melody and see what you can come up with. So let me do this. I'm gonna improvise just a little bit for you on some A sections, and I'm just gonna use the major scale. Okay, so there was some diatonic playing. I played entirely the B flat major scale. I may have bent to a note or something once or twice. It was hard, hard to really limit myself like that. But I think pretty much everything I played was stolen from somewhere. Those were great melodies played by great musicians before me. The last two A sections was sort of a version of uh, my memory of Joe Henderson. Joe Henderson made this great album called Musings for Miles, I think. Um, and there was a song on there called Swing Spring, I think. And in the middle of this like astoundingly hip solo, 
Joe plays this incredibly diatonic 16 measures. I, the way I remember it, it's two A sections, and in the 15th measure, he adds a little minor third to make it sound kind of bluesy. But it was this part. Something like that. Um, he's coming down a scale, right? Um, so simple, but it works. And here's the thing. This is not beginner stuff. I know some people have already bailed because they're like, oh yeah, Jeff's being lame. He's not talking about hip, you know, tritone substitutes built on the whatever with the minor third chord progression diminished thing. Yeah, glad those guys are gone because <laughs> when we listen to those guys, it sounds like a really funky math equation when they're playing. They have to balance that. Now, I love that kind of playing. I love the math equation playing, but we have to balance it. Coltrane knew that. John Schofield knows that. Joe Anderson knew that, that we have to play some melody in there too. And lots of times melody means bringing it back. We have to have some give and take. Everything just can't be 11 out of 10 on the harmonic scale all the time, right? So for those of us just getting used to uh, playing rhythm changes, just this idea that you can relax, forget the chords, and play diatonically. That can be really, really good advice. For the most advanced of us out there, remember that your heroes do this kind of playing a lot in their solos, whether it's to start the solo and get things going. But Joe Henderson put this, you know, well into his solo. It was very interesting. I remember really caught my ear how simple and sing-songy it was. And what a cool, he picked such a cool moment to do that. And then what he played right after it was again, this like wild uh, angular kind of thing that Joe would also love doing. So this is a really important way to go. So this approach to the rhythm changes, doesn't matter whether you're you know more at the beginner novice level, or if you're a pro that's been out there doing this for 35 years, to play 16 measures diatonically, um, like very limited, but with a compelling melody, that is the hardest thing. That is way harder than tricky diminished scales and tritone subs and everything like that. A good, compelling melody. So that's what I want us all to do. So that's gonna be our start on rhythm changes here. We're going to get into playing the changes. We're gonna get into some modern perspectives on it. And of course, we'll look at the bridge a little bit as we go along. So thank you for tuning in to Digging Deeper here. I uh, hope we'll see you here. And if you want a, like a really organized way to work through this material, jazzwire.net is the place to go. So I hope maybe I'll see you there too. All right, folks, thanks so much. Take care.